Okay, let's get started with lecture. It's good to see some faces that I didn't see for a while in the audience, so good. Even if you missed a couple of lectures, make sure you come back. I'm going to declare Thursday officially as bring a friend to lecture day. So I'm sure every one of you know someone in this class who is not currently in this lecture. Make it your personal goal to bring them to class on Thursday. Um, I think the 61A midterm was just done yesterday night. Give yourselves a hand. 
So now you have all of the time until October 1st to work on the 16A midterm. <laughs> um, okay, with that, um, some other announcements. I know there's been some confusion about rooms for office hours. I'm sorry about that. There were some double bookings. Today, my office hours will be right after class in 144 MA. Um, after that, they will largely be in 212 Cori, with some exceptions when there's other bookings. And uh, the website ha calendar has been updated. So in case you cannot find the office hours, please check the website. You're also welcome to bring a friend to office hours. Um, OK, other reminders. Homework to self grades are due uh, today. Okay, there was a question about resubmissions, so let me quickly answer that. You are allowed, if you want to resubmit your homework for partial credit, because you know maybe you didn't, you weren't able to do some part of the problem and you want to be able to recover that credit after learning how this problem actually works from the solutions, you can also do that today. You will have to submit your self grade, your resubmitted homework, as well as your uh, resubmitted self grades. They will all be due tonight. I will take other questions on this after lecture, just because I need to get through a bunch of stuff, OK? Mm -hmm. um, homework three is released. Uh, it will be due on Friday at midnight. Homework three has an interesting part to it. Homework three has a problem that says, make your own problem. How many people have seen this? So one of the things that we keep hearing in this class is like, oh, you know, there's this, like, we learned about a cool tomography ap application, that's great, but do you think these ideas could be applied to? Insert your favorite topic here. And this is an opportunity for all of you to kind of engage those creative juices. We have in the past used ideas from student submitted homework problems, and sometimes even the problem itself, to actually make problems for the next uh, for the next class. We've used these ideas in midterm problems. So in case you submit a cool idea, in case you have a really nice problem, you have a really great advantage on that midterm. Because who knows, that problem might be the problem that actually shows up on the midterm. So the reason that we have something like a make your own problem, homework problem in the, in the homework is because really we see this as something where you get to learn not just by doing things that we tell you to do, but also doing things that you think are important and you think are interesting. We don't want you to limit yourself to learning only the exact same things we talk about in lecture and in homework and in discussion. Go find some cool new application. Make a problem. It doesn't have to be restricted to the material on homework three. You can do any anything up until you know homework three is completely in scope. So you don't have to restrict yourself. OK, last announcement. Tomorrow, Wednesday, 4 to 5 PM, there is the EECS colloquium. How many of you have heard of the EECS colloquium? This is a talk that happens every Wednesday, 4 to 5 in the department. Um, and it's on a variety of topics. Tomorrow's talk, I thought, would be something that would be particularly interesting to many of you. Uh, the talk is being given by Ranveer Chandra, who is a former colleague of mine at Microsoft Research, and he's going to be talking about a project that I was slightly involved in when I was at MSR. He's talking about how you can use AI to actually empower farmers and develop technology that can improve the throughput and efficiency of agriculture. So it's a really cool application how, of how ideas from machine learning, linear algebra, circuits, uh, are being used and deployed in a very real world, real world system. And it really brings together different ideas that we're touching upon in, um, 16A. Of course, it's a research talk, so it won't, you know, break down the concepts the way we do in 16. But I think it might be something that would interest a lot of you. So, um, I highly recommend going and checking it out. There'll be some, probably some interesting robotics, some interesting sensing technologies. Um, yeah, let me know what you think. OK, so now on to what we are going to do today. We stopped yesterday, uh, not yesterday, but last lecture, talking about inversion. And we're going to keep talking a little bit more about inversion today. And then we'll go on to talk about matrix vector multiplication as transformation of spaces. 
and define more uh, concretely what we mean by by spaces. Uh, we've seen some examples, but we will actually go on to define uh, a vector space. I'm not sure we'll actually get to defining null spaces, but um, we will see how the lecture goes. So with that, let's start. So last time, we talked about the following example, right? We had um, this set of pumps, A, B, C, half of the water from A went into B, half of the water from A went into C, one went from B into A, and we had one unit of water going this way. And we set up the transition matrix for this in lecture, right? We said, what is the outflow from A? There's zero going from A into A. There's one half going from A into B, one half going from A into C. Then there is one going from B into A, zero, zero. And only this link is one, so zero, one, zero, right? Everyone clear on how this matrix was set up? We did a bunch of this last time. And you should have seen a problem similar to this in discussion as well, right? How many people went to discussion yesterday? Good. So you all saw the, the website problem, right? OK, great. And so we know here, we had this state vector x. And we, had, we were looking at x at different time stops, right? We were looking at x. We said that x at time t plus 1, when the clock ticks, is q times x at time t. And then we asked the following question. We wanted to write x of t minus 1 as a function of x of t. Right? The question was, can you go back in time? Can you understand the inverse map? What happened at time t minus 1 if I tell you what happened at time t? And how did we go about solving that? Well, we said that if we want to have some kind of linear map that goes from x of t minus, uh, x, that takes x of t to x of t minus 1, we want basically x of t minus 1 to be equal to p times x of t, right? Where p is some matrix. And then what did we do? Does anyone remember how we went about trying to understand this inverse map? Yeah? Exactly, we somehow solved that equation, right? The magic is in the, so we basically like tried to write this as an equation and solve that equation, right? All this class, it seems like this class is always about solving equations. Just as a reminder, um, there's a no tech policy in class, unless you have an exception. Everyone, please turn off your laptops, please turn off your cell phones, remind your neighbor, Please be polite and kind and friendly to your neighbors by respecting this policy. People, there are some people who have exceptions. You know who you are. You are absolutely welcome to use your, uh, use your devices. Um, OK. So coming back to our problem. Here, we have this setup, right? We want to find, do we know a p? Do we know this p? We don't know this p. But what do we know? When we want to find out something, we try to say, well, what do we know? We know this, right? This is what we know. And if we know x of t plus 1 is q times x of t, what can we say about t minus 1 and t? Right? Can we use this to write an equation about that? So we can say that x of t, so instead of t minus 1, I'm writing t here, is q times what should I write here? t minus 1. So now, what would happen if I was to multiply both sides of this equation by what we know? What do we know? We know that if I take x of t minus 1 and multiply it by q, what do I get? 
So if I multiply this by q, what am I going to get? x of t. And so if I multiply this by q here, I have to get this equation, right? I get x of t is equal to q times p times x of t. And so if I have this setup, what does q times p have to be for this equation to be true? It has to be 1, right? That's that, but, but now we're talking about matrices and vectors. So what is the parallel to 1 in the matrix world? The identity matrix, right? So does everyone see why to have an inverse map we need q times p to be the identity matrix? This is important. Like, I don't, I really don't want you guys to just memorize that this should be true. I want you to see why this should be true. That's why I'm doing this again. I know we went really fast at the end of class last time, but this is really important. Does everyone understand what I'm trying to say? Good. So we have Q times P equal to the identity matrix. And remember, the identity matrix is a matrix with ones on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. When I write something like this, I mean I'm going to fill in all this area with zeros and all this area with zeros, and ones are only going to be along the diagonal. And then here we defined the inverse of Q, right? So we defined inverse of Q as a matrix P such that p times q is equal to q times p equal to identity, right? Everyone remember we did this at the, last of uh, at the end of class last time? And then we did the magic step of we somehow solved for p, right? Somehow we decided, well, this is enough for us to figure out what p is. So what did we do? Question? No, OK. Um, OK, so we want to find p such that q times p is equal to identity. And what is this q? So we know that q is 0, 1 half, 1 half, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. And let's try and write out some generic p, right? We don't know what p is. So we've been talking about knowns and unknowns a lot in this class. So what are our unknowns? The elements of P, right? So we have basically P11, P12, P13, P21, P22, P23, P31, P32, P33. And we want this to be equal to the identity matrix. And then what did we do? We said that, wait, matrix, matrix multiplication is just a stack of matrix vector multiplication, right? So what I can do is I can think of this matrix, matrix multiplication as Q times this column is equal to this column. Q times this second column is equal to this second column. And q times this third column is equal to this third column. Right? Does everyone remember that? And then we said, well, what is this? What is a matrix vector multiplication? What have we doing? What have we been doing all this time in this class? Right? It's just a Gaussian elimination. So how do we solve these Gaussian eliminations? We solve them by setting up an augmented matrix. Right? We say, OK, I want to solve this 0, 1 half, 1 half, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. And then I put the B vector here, 0, 0. But now I have three different B vectors, right? I want to solve for this, this, and this. So we said that instead of doing this three times, we can actually do it in one shot. And so we're going to write all three of these all in one go.
And now what we do is we pretend as though we're just solving for the first equation, but we just do the same operations on these other two columns as well. So we do exactly what we would do in Gaussian elimination if we were to be solving just for an augmented matrix with one B vector, except on the side, we sneak in a bunch of other B vectors. So what would be the first row operation that you would do? Actually, take a minute and just like talk to your neighbor about whether this makes sense and how you're going to proceed from here on out. Make sure your neighbor understands uh, what we did. Help each other out. How are you going to solve this system, right? Everyone knows how you're going to solve this system. What would be the first step you would want to try and do? We're going to do some kind of row reduction, right? We're going to do some kind of Gaussian elimination here. There's a couple of different ways you can do it. I can tell you the, the first step that I took. I said, I like it when there's a 1 up here. So I said, let's swap row 2 for row 1. And I got 0, 1, 0. Oops, nope, that did not work out. What should I do? What should I get here if I swap row 2 for row 1? I should get row 2 here, right? So what should this be? This should be 1 half, 0, 1. 0, 1, 0. I should have 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1 half, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Does everyone see how I got this augmented matrix from this augmented matrix? Are there any questions about this? I just swapped these, right? OK. Now what am I going to do? Um, what do we want to try and do when we're doing Gaussian elimination? What is the thing that is sticking out at us that we want to get rid of? It's this guy, right? Everyone with me? So how do we get rid of this guy? What row operation do we want to do? Row 3 minus row 1. So I have 1 half, 0, 1. 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. But row 3, 1 half minus 1 half is 0. 0 minus 0 is 0. 0 minus 1 is minus 1. Uh, 0 minus 0 is 0. 0 minus 1 is minus 1. 1 minus 0 is 1. So here, if I just had had this b vector, I would have just gotten 0 minus 0 is 0. But now, because I have these two other columns here, I do 0 minus 1, and I get this minus 1 here, and I get 1 minus 0 and this 1 here. OK, what's the next step? If now I want to, so now what do we have? We have the form that we like, right? What is this form? We have this upper triangular form. But we're going to go a little bit further. We're going to actually go to the point where we can not just back substitute to find out the values, but we can actually just read off the values. So for that, I'm going to try and make it so that there's ones only on the diagonal and nowhere else. So what does that mean? If I have 1, 1, 1, so if I have like, if I had a, as in the side, if I had an augmented matrix, that look like this.
What would be the value of x3? What would be the value of x2? Be, and what is the value of x1? Right? So this is a very, very special kind of upper triangular matrix. In fact, it's the identity matrix. So what we can do once we get to this upper triangular form is we can keep processing this until we get to this form where we actually have the identity matrix. So to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, let's take row 3 and multiply it by minus 1. So I get 1 half, 0, 1. 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. So I multiply by minus 1, so I get a 0 times minus 1 is here. What do I, is 0. What do I get here? 1, negative 1. Great. And now, um, what is the thing that I want to get rid of? This guy, right? I want to make this look like this. What is missing here for having this be closer to an identity? I want to make this guy be a 0. So again, I can do another row operation. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, let's take row 1 minus row 3. And what is the nice thing about this upper triangular form? Now, because I have all these zero he zeros here, when I use row 3 to deal with any of the other rows, I can have like directed attention at a specific variable, right? If I was to use, try and use row 2 to do something here, I would lose this 0, right? I would pollute information from this x2 into here. But because I have this nice 0 structure here, there is going to be no influence of the first or the second variable when I'm trying to remove this third variable. Is that clear to everyone? Why we're, why we're choosing this bat, like we, we go and first create this upper triangular matrix and then we revert back. So now we do one half, one half, so R th R1 minus R3, one minus, one half minus zero is one half, zero minus zero is zero, and one minus one is zero. We get the zero we wanted. Zero minus zero is zero, one minus one is zero, and zero minus one is 1. And then we get the other rows are the same. OK, and what's the last step we need to do to make this look like the identity matrix? 2 times row 1, right? So we get 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 2, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. 0, 1, minus 1. So at this point, we've done so much algebra that you've forgotten where we started. Do people understand what we're doing here? Does, like, are there any confusions about whether um, this is any different or the same from Gaussian elimination that we've been doing so far? Does everyone see that it's the same thing? Same it's the same process. And now, I want to look at this special matrix that we've gotten here, this guy. And remember, in this particular setup, when we had just one column vector on the right-hand side, what did we have? We knew that the first variable must be b1, the second variable must be b2, the third variable must be b3. We were trying to solve for these three column vectors, right? So now that we have this matrix, what can we say is our P matrix? Our P matrix must be exactly this guy, right? We had P11, P12, P13, P21, P22, P23, P31, P32, P33. So what is the value of P11? What is the value of P23? What is the value of P32? Does everyone see where this parallel is coming from? I'm like, I don't get a sense that you guys are all on the same page as me. Does anyone have a question? Do you want to take a minute to like talk and see if you have a question? Yes, question. The 
this is basically just a larger version of that. So the question is, is this basically a larger version of when you have only one, you know, one set of equations? And the answer is exactly yes. It's like you say that I want to have a system of equations that has... So we've been solving systems of equations that are like ax equal to b, right? What if I wanted to find ax equal to b and a, or let's say ax1 equal to b1 and ax2 equal to b2? If I wanted to find x1 and x2, instead of having to solve these two equations twice, I can write this as a x1 where this is the first column, x2, this is the second column, is equal to b1, b2, where these are columns. So I can rewrite this as this, and that's exactly what we've done here. It's a good question. If you're confused about something, probably someone else is too, so ask questions. We will get to that question in, like, five to ten minutes. The question was, how does this connect to linear dependence? And that is exactly what you're going to find out in this lecture. Yeah. Can you, have more than one inverse? Can you have more than one inverse? Great question. We're going to get to that as well. Just give me five minutes. Question. <laughs> Sorry, I, can you speak up? I really can't hear. So the question is, does this P matrix imply that one of the wells had negative water at minus 1? That's a great question. Um, and the answer is sort of yes. So if we look at our graph here, and remember, when we were trying to do inverses, when we first started doing inverses, we said if, remember what we said? We said that if um, x of t is equal to, let's say, 1, 0, 0. What is x of t minus 1, right? Remember we asked this question? So x of t is 1, 0, 0 means that there is one unit of water in A and 0 in B and 0 in C, right? So what that means is then um, if there's one unit of water in A at the current time and no water in B and C at the current time, where did the water in A come from? There's one unit here. How can water come into A? From B, right? So that means that x at time t minus 1 must have been 0, 1, 0. Right? We did this example. So now, what about the following case? What if x of t is equal to the following? 0, 0, 1. What if x of t is 0, 0, 1? Take a minute and, like, I mean, it'll, this is this will answer your question. Take a minute, talk to your neighbor, and figure out what should have been the x of t minus one if currently x of t is zero zero one. Make sure everyone has someone to talk to. Don't make people feel left out. Do you have an exception for your laptop? Yeah.
Okay, how many people think they can figure out? How many people need a hint? How many people are done? So people don't need a hint and they're not done. High hands, high hands. How many people are done? Okay, I won't call on you. How many people, okay. How many people need a little bit more time? Okay, 30 seconds. Okay, let's think about this together. So let's come back to the question that was asked. The question that was asked was, does this P matrix mean that there was negative water somewhere? And let's look at this 0, 0, 1, right? So if there's one unit of water in C right now, where could that water have come from? A, there's only one place, right? Can all of the water in A have come to C? No, how much water from A can have come to C? Half of it. So how much water must there have been in A? Two units of water, right? So if A had two units of water, OK, so let's say A had two units of water. Notice what we have here. And then the clock ticks. Where is that two units of water going to go? Let's say A has two units of water. The clock ticks. One unit of water is going to flow to B, right? And where is the other one unit of water going to flow to? Sorry, one unit of water is going to flow to C, and the other one unit of water is going to flow to B, right? So what is B going to end up with when the clock ticks? One. But does B have one unit of water in our vector? No. So when you have a one and you want to make it a zero, what do you need? You need a negative one. So if you wanted to get a negative 1 into B, where could a negative 1 in B have come from? C, right? So the only option that you're left with is to have this kind of aphysical negative water flowing from C into B. And if you now look at this column for this inverse map, what do you see? We have basically... 2 in A, 0 in B, and negative 1 in C. Remember, if you, and so if you were to look at, so let's make this orange because this maps this orange thing. And um, remember, for the case where x of t is 1, 0, 0, what did you get? You got exactly this, right? These two match. So what the inverse is, it's telling you what are the transformations of these three, what we're going to define eventually as elementary vectors. Elementary vectors are basically in the three-dimensional space are going to be these three vectors. Um, what color do I want to use? Zero, uh, one, zero, 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 one, zero, and zero, zero, one, right? These guys are special vectors. And we saw that at the end of last class. Why? Because any, what is the span of these three vectors? The span of these three vectors is R3, right? So any vector in R3 can be represented as a linear combination of these guys. OK, so does that answer the question of, is there some kind of negative water? Thanks. Absolutely. So if we start out with negative 1 at B, yes, but we're starting out with negative 1 at C. No, no, no. If we start out with 0 at B. If we start out with 0 at B. As, as time clicks, we have plus 1 from A, minus 1 from C, so it gives 0, but then from B also 1 goes to A. Right, but B, how many? 1 times, so 1 times the amount of water in B, right? So let's say, so the question is, 
What about this arrow, right? The question is, what about this link between A and B? So what are we saying? We're saying that, okay, this is a bit messy, but hopefully you can understand because you guys are asking good questions. X of t minus 1 is, we said, 2, 0, minus 1. And the question is, what about the water flowing from B into A? What is the amount of water in B currently? Zero. When the clock ticks, fraction one of the water in B flows into A. So when I say this one, I don't mean one unit. If there isn't any water in B, no water is going to flow. One times zero will flow into A. So because there's zero in B, nothing is going to get added into A. If A has two units, two times half gives me one, which is going to flow into, into B. So what these are, arrows are representing is they're representing the fraction of water that is flowing, not the units of water that are flowing, right? Does that clarify the question? Okay, great, good question. Question at the back. What is the physical interpretation of negative one uh, water? So this is a great question. And this is something that you will start learning more about when we get into the circuits module. And the reason that we have this set up, this problem set up, is because that there is um, a connection that you will see. But for many physical quantities, you can actually have a positive amount of that quantity or a negative amount of that quantity. We're starting with the simple model, and water is easy to think about. Um, so we're starting there. Um, you could think about it as there's a baseline reservoir, and then you have a drought, and water goes below that baseline. It's one way to think about negative water. Um, but you will be starting to think about things like positive charges and negative charges um, soon as we get into module two. This is a simplified model for other uh, things that you will come to in the class, which will actually have concrete physical interpretations for positivity and negativity. One obvious example is power, which is also something that we can think about in these forms. Question in the back. Wouldn't negative in this system just mean that there's backflow? One way to think about it is backflow. Basically, um, you basically you're thinking about um, removing the water is really how I would think about it. Backflow will be slightly uh, trickier, and you would want to set up these uh, these systems differently. So I would recommend trying not to think about it as backflow and trying to think about it really as removing water. Okay, other questions? Okay, yes. Great question. If we were to switch this somehow and try to find the inverse of this matrix, would we end up with our initial value? Great question. We'll just, we'll get right to that. Um, and some of these other questions that were asked around here. We will get to these um, very good. Oh, by the way, one piece of terminology jargon that I wanted to mention that I forgot. We'll get to that question just in a minute. What we just did here, we've always been calling it Gaussian el elimination. But when we do this step all the way getting to this to be an identity, what this is called is called Gauss-Jordan elimination. Gauss-Jordan elimination is just the slight difference between going, like when we can't go just to upper triangular form, we call this Gaussian elimination. This is called George, the Gauss-Jordan method or Gauss-Jordan elimination. And this was um, also apparently discovered. So Jordan like modified from here to here, apparently in 1888, which was also independently discovered by Clausen also in 1888. But somehow... The name Jordan got associated with the method, and Clausen didn't. And of course, as we mentioned in the first class, this was all you know, um, written down in ancient Chinese texts all the way, I think, in like 100 or 150 BC. Um, and these names only were given much, much later. OK, so quick historical interlude. And let us keep moving. 
So, we have now found a matrix Q, a uh, matrix P, su sorry, such that Q times P is equal to identity. And remember we saw that matrix multiplication does not commute, right? So in general, P times Q does not equal to uh, Q times P. But remember, when we defined this here, we said that for inversion, we have P times Q equal to Q times P equal to identity. And why are we allowed to do that? And so to answer this question, we're going to get to the following theorem. Theorem which says that the left inverse I-N-V-E-R-S-E, is the same as the right inverse. And so what am I saying here? Let us say Q times P equal to identity. So P is right multiplying Q. Q is left multiplying p, right? q is on the left side, so we call it left multiplication. p is on the right side, so we call it right multiplication, right? There's really nothing um, fancy happening here. It's just names. But now say, so we know that this is true. So let's say p is um, the inverse on the right side. And let's say we had a different inverse on the left side. So let there be some r such that r times q is equal to i, where r is now on the left side, right? So now, what can I do in this case? So I know this, so we can write this as a proof. Let's say there is some r. The question is, is r equal to p, or is it not equal to p? Well, what can I do? I can take r times q, and I can multiply it on the right by p, right? And I can take the identity, and I can also multiply it on the right by p. So what do I get? I know that matrix multiplication is associative. So I can write this as r times qp is equal to what is identity times p? Just p. And what is q times p? It's just the identity. So we have r times identity equal to p, which implies that r is equal to p. So what does this mean? That if p times, or if q times p is equal to identity, then p times q is also equal to the identity. Because if there was any other matrix R such that R times Q would be the identity, then that matrix would have to be equal to P. What you have just proved is that Q, if Q times P is equal to identity, then P times Q is also equal to identity for square matrices P and Q. Does that make sense? Yeah, question in the black sweatshirt. Mm -hmm. Great question. The question is, how do you know that such an R exists at all? And one way to check this is you can actually do out the multiplication. So you can like write out this element by element, and you will you can actually do a constructor proof to show that such an R should exist using the fact that um, Q times P equal to identity and using the interpretation of matrix multiplication as a matrix times uh, rows and columns. This is something that I don't have time to fully write out in class right now, but I highly encourage you to try and do it on your own. And if it doesn't make sense, uh, come to office hours. Yeah. Would this still apply if P and Q were NXN and NXN matrices respectively? Good question. What question was, what happens if P and Q are not uh, square matrices. So right now we haven't yet defined a notion of inverse for non-square matrices. In the third module, you will get to something kind of defining an, uh, like an inverse for non-square matrices, and you'll explore this even more in uh, 
16b. So hold on, but by the end of the year, you will be able to teach people this stuff. Question? Do some matrices not have inverses? Great question. We will get to it in five minutes. Oh, so I said let r times q is i, and then I multiplied on both sides by p. And so i times p is like when I multiply something by the identity transform. Remember when we had the identity transform pumps? You ran the pumps, and you just got out the same state. So if I do the identity transform on the matrix P, I just get out P again. That's all that happened to the I. Is that answer the question? Yeah. There's a lot of like, these things are very subtle. The, you have to be very, very careful. And I'm glad you guys are asking all these questions because it's really easy to think that something is like obvious and miss the subtlety in these steps. So I'm thrilled to see that you guys are thinking critically and asking these kinds of questions about it. They're bound to come up more and more. Please come to office hours. Please reach out to us in homework party so that you can actually um, resolve these. But I want to move on now and have a second theorem that says not only is the left inverse equal to the right inverse, but also that the matrix inverse is unique. And for this, I'm going to say if there was P1 such that um, P1 times Q is equal to Q times P1 equal to identity, and P2 such that P2 times Q is equal to Q times P2 is equal to identity, what I want to prove that there's only one inverse. I cannot have two inverses. So I want to say that in this situation, P1 must be equal to P2. And how am I going to say that? I'm going to say basically that let's consider P1 times Q. And again, I'm going to do the same trick I did here. I'm going to multiply again by P. I'm going to consider this guy. So what is Q times P? Q, oh, sorry, Q times P2. Sorry, good question. I didn't tell you what Q times P was. What is Q times P2? I. So this is equal to P1 times I. I'm just copying the P1, and I'm replacing Q times P2 equal to I. So this is this I. On the other hand, what is P1 times Q? Also I, right? And then I'm just going to copy this P2. But what is this equal to? What is I times P2? P2. And what is P1 times I? P1. So if I have two inverses, what does that mean? That both of them must be the same. So that means that if P times Q is equal to identity, Q times P equal to identity, if I tell you that there's two inverses, then you know, um, basically you can tell me that I'm wrong because there's only one inverse. You just prove that it's unique. Any questions about this? So now I'm not sure I'm going to have the time to actually do this out. We shall see. But I'm going to tell you this. OK, take a minute. Remember, we calculated this P. I want you to see that this is actually the inverse. So take this p and multiply this q and see what you get. And choose randomly whether you do p times q or q times p. So here, can you see all of this? No, you can't. OK, I'll just rewrite this out. 1, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 0. This is q. And p is equal to q inverse, we claim, is this thing, this guy. 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1. OK. And I want, OK, this side of the room, I want you to compute P times Q. OK? This row. This side of the room, you compute Q times P. And the middle, this side, choose this, half room, 
choose that, OK? Take one minute and compute these matrix products. You guys are doing one, and you guys are doing the other. Let's see which side finishes faster. I have 30 seconds. Talk to your neighbors. Talk to your neighbors. I didn't say every alternate person do a different calculation. How many people are done? How many people actually wrote any number on the paper? OK, good. How many people, like, I hope you actually did the calculation. So what is p times q? Identity matrix. And what is q times p? So do you see that you know, we did this kind of weird operation? And we justified it. We said that we're solving a system of linear equations. We understood why we're solving the system of linear equations. But we needed to verify that what we got out in the end was actually the inverse. And do you see now why we call p the inverse of q? Hopefully this makes it clear. And also you can see that p times q and q times p are both the same. OK? Question? What inspired us to do that Gaussian elimination? So that was what we discussed here, right? We discussed the fact that if x of t minus 1 is equal to p times x of t, then we derived that the only such p must have the following property, must have the property that q times p is identity. Right? Because when we multiply both sides by q here, we get x of t, and we get if x of t is equal to q times p times x of t. The only transform that allows for that is q times p equal to identity. Does that make sense? Yeah, but because we're trying to solve exactly this system. And that is exactly how we set up this system. Right? So if this doesn't make sense, uh, come to office hours. It is subtle. These are good questions. Keep these questions, and please, please bring them to office hours where I can you know, explain to you much more slowly and much more detail. OK. So now there were a bunch of questions, right? There were questions of like, does the inverse exist? What about linear dependence? What about linear independence? These are all good questions, because remember, what we did here was we did this Gaussian elimination procedure, right? But what was the thing that you've always been told to be wary of in Gaussian elimination? Row of zeros, right? Row of zeros is red flags. So what happens if you end up getting a row of zeros, right? Do you always have an inverse? That was the question. Someone around here asked this question, right? And the answer is, no, you do not always have an inverse. So in, when we're thinking about real numbers, right? we think about 0. Does 0 have an inverse? Right? We don't define an inverse for 0. Right? We don't really talk about 1 over 0 as a thing. We talk about 1 over 5 as a thing, but we don't talk about 1 over 0 as a thing. And in the same way, in kind of this matrix multiplication world, we have the same notion. And this is very much connected to linear dependence. So what if we had the following system of pumps? For example, 1, 1, 
and our Q matrix was equal to the following. 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1 third, 1 third, 1 third. And I tell you that X of T is 1, 0, 0. What was X of T minus 1? I'll give you two options. Given that what does X of T is 1, 0, 0 means all the water is currently in A. If I tell you that all the water is currently in A, what do you know about where the water was in the previous time step? We just did a calculation like this, right? So was all of the water in C? Was all of the water in B? Was all of the water in A? Is it possible to have, if currently all the water is in A, is it possible that there was no water in B before, no water in C before, and the water in A just stayed in A? Is this transformation possible? What about if there was nothing in A, nothing in C, but all of the water was in B? Is this transformation possible from one zero zero um, from zero one zero to one zero zero? So, can we d understand what x of t minus one was given x of t? No, right? So, is this map? Is this map? Is this transition map that is transitioning from these state vectors? Is this invertible? No, right? What does it mean for something to be invertible? If I tell you where it is now, you can tell me where it was at the previous time step. But here, this is clearly an example of something that is not invertible. And what do you observe about this matrix, something that we've been looking at before? Yeah? The columns are linearly dependent, right? In fact, here, they're exactly the same. Right? So the columns are linearly dependent. And what does that mean if you do Gaussian elimination on this guy? What are you going to get? A row of zeros. How are you going to see that you get a row of zeros? What happens when you do row 3 minus row 2? Right? Here, row 3 minus row 2 gives row of zeros. So what do we see here? We see that sometimes we have no solution. So what will happen when we set up this system? 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1 third, 1 third, 1 third, to be 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. What's going to happen? We're going to get a row of zeros, right? And what does a row of zeros mean? Row of zeros means that we're going to have either infinite solutions or no solutions. And if I get a row of zeros, and I get a b that is not equal to 0 here, what does this mean? No solutions. But I'm guaranteed in this setup, actually. So I have, to, I have to satisfy multiple equations here, right? I have to satisfy this b vector, and this b vector, and this b vector. And because each of these has this 1 in a different place, I'm never going to end up with this bottom row also being entirely zeros. See, the columns of this matrix on the left side are linearly dependent, right? And so we know that we're going to have this row of zeros here. The columns on the right-hand side, if we just look at this matrix, are they linearly dependent? No, right? So when we do any kind of row operations on this guy, are we going to end up with a row of zeros in here. 
So can we get a row of zeros equal to a row of zeros? No, we will always get a row of zeros here equal to a row of not all zeros. There'll be at least one element that is not all zeros. And what that means is that means that we're going to end up in a situation where there's no solution, which means that there is no inverse for this matrix. Does that make sense? So now this is where stuff is starting to get conceptual, and this is where you really need to be paying attention. We are now drawing on multiple lectures worth of material that you have been building up on. It might have seemed really easy up until now, but it is because now is the time to like pull out all of these tools and connect up all of the dots. Question. The question is, why are the columns of the identity matrix linearly independent? So no, these columns are linearly independent. The columns of the identity matrix are linearly independent. Sorry if that was not uh, clear. They're linearly independent. OK? Um, if this isn't like good exercise to just go home and check if it's not clear. Are there any questions about this? So OK. So now I want to move to something even um, that builds on this even more. So we're going to have another claim or theorem. And we're going to say, if A is an invertible matrix, then AX equal to 0 has only one unique solution, which is x equal to 0. Remember, we defined this to be the homogeneous equation. Homo so remember, we've been thinking as an aside, before we get to that, we've been thinking about these systems of equations, ax equal to b. And now that we have inverses, we can start thinking about these equations in kind of um, more methodical ways. We can think about a as something that is taking this vector x into b as a transformation. And then b can be brought back to x by using a inverse. So if I now want to write um, this in a different format, I can say let A inverse be the inverse of A. So I can multiply this by A inverse on both sides. And now what do I get? A inverse times A here is just identity. So x is equal to A inverse B. And so think about it. If I had a certain state of water in the pumps, I can go from time t to time t plus 1, which is how we define the system. But A inverse allows us to go back and forth. So if you can think of x and b at the, as the states of the system at two different times, you can think of it this way. See how similar this is to just the simple algebra that you did um, in your earlier classes, right? Like if I knew that x is equal to 5y, I can write y is equal to 1 over 5x, right? Or to be more precise, 5 inverse x. This is very, very parallel to this. Question at the back. Sorry, can you speak up? I really can't hear. Oh, if A is an invertible matrix, and inver so what, when, when I say A is an invertible matrix, it means that A has an inverse. So these are two ways of saying the same thing. Um, yeah, question. So earlier when we were looking at the matrix, like, you can't have matrix, you have uh huh. So, so the question was, why, why, like, what happens? Why can the, so if the identity matrix cannot have a row of zeros, and let me just reinterpret your question. Tell me if I'm right. The, 
if you have linearly dependent columns, you will get a row of zeros on the left side. You will not get a row of zeros on the right side because the columns of the, lin of the identity matrix are linearly independent. And so you have a row of zeros equal to a row of non-zeros, which means no solutions, which means that there's no inverse. So because, yeah, exactly. You cannot have infinite solutions because you have zero equal to a non-zero. Yeah, the, the system is not consistent. OK, so this was an aside. So the claim, if A is an invertible matrix, then AX equal to 0 has only one unique solution, X equal to 0. So we want to prove this. And now we want to use this setup and this notation. This is really just notation, right? This A inverse is just a notation. Instead of trying to remember P and Q as two different notations, this is just a way of keeping track of things. Like, there's nothing more here than notation. So then, um, let us say x1 is a solution to this, right? So x1 is such that a times x1 is equal to the 0 vector. So now, if you want to prove that x1 must be 0, what do you feel like doing to this equation? Multiplying by A inverse, right? It's like really wanting to be multiplied. You have A inverse times A times x1. And then what do you have to do on the other side? A inverse times the 0 vector. And what is A inverse times A? Identity. So here we get x1. And A inverse times 0 just gives me the 0 vector, right? Remember, no matter what matrix I have here, if I multiply it by a 0 vector, I'm basically taking 0 times the first column, 0 times the second column, 0 times the third column, 0 times all of the columns, which always gives me 0. So a, any matrix times the 0 vector is always the 0 vector. And so what does this mean? This means that x1 must be 0, right? So any solution to this equation for an invertible A, right? Why could I multiply by this A inverse? What allowed me to multiply by this A inverse? I told you that A is an invertible matrix, right? What if A was not invertible? What if A was like this weird example that we just looked at? Where did my weird example go? This example, right? Was Q an invertible matrix here? No, right? So could you use this theorem for this Q? No, right? Because here, Q is not an invertible matrix. We showed that for this Q, there is no inverse. So in the case that A is invertible, we have this. So now, finally, we can actually get to the question that was asked and talk about the connection between invertibility and uh, linear independence. So we can say theorem, this matrix A is invertible if and only if the columns of A are linearly independent. OK, so how do we prove this? So we know first part, part one. There are two parts this theorem. First, you have to show that if A is invertible, the columns must be linearly independent. So that means if A inverse exists, then we know that AX equal to 0 implies X equal to 0, right? We just proved this, right? This theorem says that if A is invertible and AX equal to 0, then X must be equal to 0. 
But what does this mean? What is AX? AX is a linear combination of the columns of A, right? And so that means that if there's a linear combination of the columns of A that is equal to zero, that means that all of the weights must be exactly zero, right? We've worked this out. I'm going fast because at this point, you need to be able to be comfortable with going back and forth between the column interpretation of matrix multiplication and the row interpretation. If this is not clear, please, please come talk to me at office hours. And so AX equal to 0 means X equal to 0 implies that columns of A are linearly independent. OK? And part two, what if the columns of A are linearly independent? So that means we know from our previous lectures that AX equal to B has a unique solution for all B. So does AX equal to 1, 0, 0, 0? Does this have a solution? Yes. What is this solution in terms of the inverse? In terms of the columns of the inverse, what is this X that you find as a solution of this? It's the first column, right? Remember how we set this up here? The first column is the solution to this guy times x equal to this guy. So does ax equal to 0, 0, where there's a 1 somewhere in the middle? Does this have a solution? This has a solution. So does that mean I can find every single column of this matrix? So if I can solve this to find a solution, a value for every single one of these things, if I can actually find the inverse, what does that mean? The inverse must exist, right? So this means that the inverse exists. So that means that A is invertible, because the columns of A are linearly independent. OK, so is this clear? I'll take one question. For the previous claim about this being x being equal to 0, how did we show it was actually a unique solution? So for this theorem, for this claim, we said that let if, if there was some x that solved ax1 equal to 0, we can prove that this x must actually be equal to 0. If x1 was not equal to 0, let's say x1 was like, you know, 35, 23, 11, negative 13. There was some vector like this. You could take x1 and multiply it by, you know that a times x1 satisfies this equal to 0. Because a inverse exists, you know, therefore, that identity times x1 must be equal to 0, which proves that x1 must be equal to 0. So it's unique because you actually solve it and show that this is the only solution. Even if x1 was not equal to 0, you prove that it's equal to 0. So if you're, you're either your original assumption of x1 not being equal to 0 was wrong, or there's a unique solution. Does that make sense? OK. So think about this. If you have more questions, please come to office hours, talk to me. But there's one last thing I want to talk about uh, today, which is we've been talking a lot about uh, these 
matrix vector maps as uh, transformations, right? OK, so we've been talking a lot about these pumps, and we have this state, and then we take the matrix, and we multiply a vector by the matrix, and then the vector goes from one, um, one state to another. The state is represented by these vectors, right? And when we talk about vectors, we're using to rep them to represent all different kinds of unknowns, right? They're representing, for example, the unknowns in your um, imaging lab. So in your imaging lab, the pixels are your unknowns, and they're, in a, they're, they're stacked up in a vector. Um, in the problem where Alice was communicating to Bob, your unknown is the message, and that is stacked up into a vector. And every time we multiply a matrix, there's some transformation that is happening. And we've been talking about this, but we haven't been very precise. But to make this more precise, I want to introduce this notion of a vector space. So what is a vector space? A vector space is basically a collection of vectors such that linear combinations of these vectors are still in the same space. And this is something that you've been dealing with and thinking about for a long time in this class. We just haven't formally defined it. Um, OK, there you go. OK, thank you. So we say that basically a vector space is a set V and F, where V is a set of vectors and F is a set of scalars, such that we have the associated property for addition. Addition is also commutative for vectors. We have a notion of an additive identity. So a vector plus the zero vector is always the same vector. V plus zero is V. And the additive inverse. So there exists the notion of a negative vector. And you've seen all of these things in, for example, the discussions, right? You saw this in the uh, rotation matrix example in the discussion. And these scalars have to satisfy some other properties. For example, they have to be associative. You have to have the multiplicative identity. You have to have uh, these be distributive. So you have to have alpha times u plus v is alpha u plus alpha v. And you also have to be distributive in scalar addition. So that means that alpha plus beta times v, where alpha and beta are scalars, is just alpha times v plus beta times v. And for example, if you've been thinking about you know, just our vectors in R3, R2, uh, all of these are actually um, uh, examples of vector spaces. So I'm out of time. You'll see more of this in discussion. And uh, see you in class on Thursday with